how do you answer the questions like, who am I and why am I here? So that's a tricky one. Whenever I get people to do this exercise, they'll, you know, start listing their hobbies, their relationship status, their job titles. And those are, I would say, the roles that you play, the roles that you have. It doesn't mean they're not genuine. Sometimes they align, sometimes they don't, but these are your roles. And I think what's important to understand is, it's a little philosophical, but bear with me. There is no self without self-expression. You can't go into a cave and come out and be like, I know who I am. Because you haven't expressed that. You haven't lived that way. So you you can think mm-hmm. you know who you are. So you can think you're the most patient person. Then you're in LA sitting in traffic and you start swearing, flipping <laughs> people off and honking. And then you go, oh my God, like that's strange. And in that moment you go, well, either I don't understand who I am or or I'm not representing who I am. But the point is that you really need to see yourself out in the world to be able to understand who you are. It cannot just be this thought. It has to be expressed. So the answer to who am I is never a verbal one. The answer to who am I is the way you live your life. And that's the really kind of cool ongoing definition because I don't believe the self is static. I think it's always evolving. I think we're always creating it. And so um, you can look in a mirror and go, this is who I am right now, today, not forever because you're constantly changing, but the answer is really in the way you show up in the world. And that's exciting because it, yes, you can see who you are now, but because it's it's how we show up in the world, then it also means like, I am who I decide to be, right? Because you can change your habits, you can change your identity, change your fashion, like, <laughs> right? Yeah, there's, I love that. It's so flexible. We can, like, because I believe we're we're always changing and evolving as well. And I like to do that with intention. But yeah, hearing your definition is is even more exciting because, <laughs> like, you can't really define yourself. You can't really define yourself. It's, yeah, it's really cool. It's like those moments of constant redefining. And I love that you use the fashion metaphor because I usually say people hope that it's like find yourself rather than create yourself. That's why I don't like the term find yourself. It's almost like you're going in a closet, trying on a bunch of sweaters. You put it on and you're like, this is it. I'm going to die in this sweater. Like, <laughs> and you know, and, and that, that that's your sweater. And I feel like that's what we try to do with our personality or identity or our sense of self. And, and a lot of that is like, no, you're going to try something on. It's going to fit in that moment. And the next moment, it's not going to be the right fit. And that's okay. And so yeah. I think it just talks yeah. to like the perpetual becoming, which to me is so exciting to the people who look in a mirror like I was 10 years ago and won't go, I hate this person, not so exciting, because they want to believe there is a version of them out there that they like more. And I kind of go, you know, you can look at yourself and not like yourself, and then you have the power to change it. But that perfect version doesn't really exist without your participation. And that's a hard truth. Yep. And then there's also the scenario I'm thinking of people who maybe had like their golden years and they're trying to hold on to that version of them, even though like maybe things have changed and then they, they try to go back to the past and live in the past. I mean, there, there's so many ways to look at this. <laughs> how do you advise people on how to love who they are as they are now and as they are ever changing? This is an interesting thing. Everyone talks about self-love so much. and I think it's great. And I think if you get to the place where you love yourself, that's fantastic. But I think there's two steps before that, actually three. (laughs) I think first you need to accept yourself where you're at, just acknowledge, accept it. Then I think you need to respect yourself. Then I think you can like yourself. And then I think you can love yourself. I don't think we can like someone that we don't respect. And so that's like a really interesting combination of like, I, I don't necessarily try to get my clients to love every version of themselves. And sometimes maybe they shouldn't (laughs) like they should be super empathetic and caring, but it's not like they should be like, wow, I'm so proud of myself right now. Regardless, it's like, it's okay not to be proud. It's okay to feel a bit of guilt or some, some emotions because they signal to you that you're not aligned with your morals, your values, you're not being your authentic self. And so for me, it's like, can you accept the version that you're being? Can you truly see it and accept it as you in this moment? And then how can we work towards pivoting your behavior so it's someone you respect? 
And once you get that self-respect, oh boy, so much changes. The way that you relate to other people, the way that you relate to yourself. And then it's so much easier to get to the like and the love. But I think a lot of the times we we avoid the acceptance and the respect, and then we're kind of shut out of luck, if I'm allowed to say that on here. <laughs> yeah. No, I love that. It's very practical. It's true. You can't jump to self-love. And I think a lot of people struggle with that concept of self-love because it feels so far away. But you're right. It's like acceptance, respect, then then maybe like, and then maybe love. Exactly. And I'm always like, you know, if you can accept and respect, that's a fairly healthy relationship to me. Like, I'm like, congratulations, you know, but we have so much yeah. pressure on this, like, <laughs> on this, like, love concept that I think is setting unrealistic expectations. People are feeling frustrated. People don't even know what that means. Like, what does it mean to love yeah. yourself? So I, I like to break it down because I think it's helpful. Yeah. Is your advice the same for those people who, like, for how to continue, I guess, loving or accepting yourself as you grow and change? When you become more intentional about your actions, and I love that you said, like, you try to live intentionally, it's so much easier to then accept what has happened. Like, you kind of get into the driver's seat and you start to change your relationship with accountability and you go, you know, I screwed up, but it's my mistake. And there's something about like, but it's mine and I own myself. And so actually the definition of authenticity, something I talk about, I think it's been grossly misused (laughs) and watered down. So what's your definition? The definition of uh, authenticity comes from Heidegger. Uh, He's a German philosopher. And the I'm not going to try to pronounce the German word for it, but there was a word for it. And the actual definition was ownness to own oneself to own. And so his definition of authenticity sounds hell of a lot like responsibility. It wasn't like, it just feels right. It's like the authentic decision is the decision you're willing to take responsibility for. And I would say it's also the decision that aligns with your morals and values and who you want to become one day. Mm -hmm. And so when you're perpetually um, becoming, I think that acceptance becomes easier because if you're becoming and you're authentic, you're owning all of it. And then it's yeah. easier to accept that that's where you are, to see yourself exactly as you are and to go, oh, that's my participation. That's what I created. Okay, let's try something different. And so I think it's, it, it becomes easier the more you understand what being authentic actually means. Yeah, no, you definitely answered my it answered my question because, and from a different angle, actually, because it makes sense. Like, if you are continuing to be authentic and responsible for your life, then you're going to continue to like accept and like and love the person you become. I think what happens when people don't like who they become is when they're not being authentic, not taking responsibility. So, so the answer is is those two things, right? Responsibility and and being authentic to yourself. Absolutely. Well summarized, (laughs) considering I was like, yeah, (laughs) I mean, these are all concepts, but I want to know in your life, what was your journey to figure out and feel really good about like, who am I? Why am I here? Like, (laughs) how long did that take? And what was that journey like? Jeez, um, I would say that took, I mean, it's, it's still happening. Obviously, it's an ongoing process. But I would say it took probably about Yeah. Always becoming. Always becoming. It took about five, six years before I started to feel kind of the embodiment, the at home sensation, the intuition, the recognition of self in the mirror, the the sort of, I have my own back. That took about five, six years. It is not a short process. And I think I took it very seriously. Um, I and I'm not suggesting everyone does this, but I did so many things that were inauthentic. They were objectively good, meaning no one would look at my life and go like, what is she doing? I hope she turns her life around. People are like, wow, congratulations. Mm -hmm. And that's what made it harder because I was like trapped Mm -hmm. in my own life. And I was so profoundly unhappy. And so what I had to do was just declutter and kind of blow it all up. <laughs> That's literally what I did to my, and I'm not suggesting everyone has to, but just my proportion of what was authentic versus inauthentic, it was like 90 10 psychology state. That's about it. And so it took a really long time because I first had to strip down everything I'm not 
to have space to create what I am. So think about cooking in a kitchen. If the kitchen is disgusting and every pot and pan and, and knife is used and scattered, you first have to clean it up before you can cook. Because mm-hmm. creativity takes space. And what you're doing is creating your sense of self. So you need space to do that from people, from expectations, from sometimes physical, I don't know, spaces, whatever it is. And so for me, it just took a really long time to figure out like what people should and shouldn't be in my life, what boundaries I wanted to set, what kind of relationships I wanted to have, who I wanted to, you know, express myself as. And the one fun sort of um, analogy or metaphor or kind of example I have for this is have you watched Runaway Bride? I actually don't think I have. (laughs) With Julia Roberts. Okay. It's okay. I'll tell you all about it. So Julia Roberts is known, her her character Maggie is known for running away at the altar. So I think it was like six men that she's left at the altar. And Richard Gere, who is a journalist or plays a journalist, hears about this. So he goes to her small town and interviews her and all her fiancés, previous fiancés, and her current fiancé. And the one question that he would ask them, which sounded really silly at the time, was, what kind of eggs does Maggie like in the morning? And they would all answer. And what was interesting about the answer is that they would all say a different answer. It was like boiled, scrambled, sunny side up. And then he would go, okay, but like, what... What eggs do you like? And guess what? It would perfectly match with the eggs she liked with each man. Uh. (laughs) I mean, who hasn't done this? And then (laughs) there's a scene where he kind of confronts Maggie and goes, oh my God, you're so lost. You don't even know what kind of eggs you like. And she goes, I'm not lost. It's just called changing my mind. And he goes, it's not changing your mind. It's not having a mind of your own. Mm. And I remember just being like, damn, And what I loved about it is that a couple scenes later, you see her in her kitchen. I don't know. She made like a dozen eggs and was trying them just in her silence, in her kitchen by herself, tasting them deliberately for the very first time. She's eaten eggs her entire life, but she sat there to be like, okay, what do I want? What aligns? What feels good? What, what, What are my eggs? And that scene, the last like couple seconds was so profound to me. And that is the approach I took to figuring myself out. You're not going to be able to just know, no matter how much you meditate, no matter how much you journal, no matter how much therapy you do, you're going to have to get out there and try things and then go, this is not the right egg. This is not the right sweater. (laughs) Right now, maybe one day it will be, but it's like, it, it is a lot of experimentation, a lot of trial and error, a lot of taking accountability for the mistakes you will make in this process. And just kind of going, I'm just going to figure it out in the world because the self is expressed in the world. 